great. So if we can go down the room and maybe just introduce ourselves and say who we are and maybe just where we are in the world. Um, I'll just start with who I can see on the screen. So Liron, if you'd like to begin. Oh, you, I think you- Social worker. And uh, I'm based in Tel Aviv, Tel Aviv University. Okay, welcome, thank you. Uh, Sadiq, I can see you down there, one of our authors. Hi, Sadiq. Hi, Roseanne. Hi. Hi, everyone. I'm Sadiq. Uh, so I'm one of the co-authors on today's reading group. I'm about to get hit with load shedding, which is unfortunate reality in South Africa, but I'll try and stay on for as long as we can. Uh, I am based at the University of Cape Town in civil engineering. Fantastic. Thanks, Sadiq, and well done. Happy to have you here. Um, Tony, do you want to introduce yourself? Yes, hi, I'm Tony. Um, I'm new to the group. Um, I used to work at WITS, but I'm currently retired. I live in Cape St. Francis on the coast in South Africa. Um, and I'm really very happy to be part of this group. I spent the morning catching up on the two previous sessions. So I feel like I know you already. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Okay, thanks, Tony. Great. Um, Anne? Um, I'm uh, Anne Swirsky. I'm an independent scholar working on children's history, and I live in Israel. Great. Thank you, Anne. Um, I'm going through the list. I, Elliot, I don't know if, are you happy to chat? Uh. Yes. Hello, everybody. My name is Elliot. I'm from Brazil. I'm a math uh, teacher there at the university. And I used to research about teacher training and I used to work with the methodology of oral history. And right now I'm spending some time here at the UCC until April. So Perfect. I'm getting into the meeting right now with you. <laughs> Perfect, yeah. Elliot's with us here at UCT, which is great. Thanks, Elliot. Um, Leslie, I don't know if you are able to introduce yourself. Thank you. Hi, uh, so I'm Leslie Lagrange. So I'm also in Cape Town, but I work at Stellenbosch University um, in the Faculty of Education. Thank you. Fantastic. Lovely to have you, Leslie. Thanks. Um, and then we have um, Petro, if you'd like to introduce yourself. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm Petra Dupria. I'm at the Northwest University in parts of Sturm, uh, South Africa, for those of you not uh, familiar with uh, South Africa. And um, yeah, I joined the group by Leslie, so thank you for the invitation. Thanks. Wonderful. Lovely to have you here. And then, hi, um, Hilary. We're just doing brief introductions, so please introduce yourself to the group, if you're able. Mm -hmm. Hi everybody. Um, I, let me start my video. Oh. Hello everybody. I'm Hilary Jenks. Um, I'm very happy to be here. I've been reading Barad for a while, still trying to make sense of them. Um, I'm working on a book on a, a, a child becoming literate and I'm trying to use a post-humanist agential realist framework. Lovely. Thanks. Nice to see you, Hilary. And then um, I think the last person for now is Ezra. Ezra, if you'd like to introduce yourself. Hi, um, I'm Ezra. I'm a graduate student at Tufts University in the United States in Massachusetts. And um, I'm studying uh, post-humanism and post-qualitative research. I'm going to mute you there. Okay. Sorry, Ezra. <laughs> That's me. 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 Nice, <laughs> yeah. Sorry, and I muted you. <laughs> oh, because they took yes. Yeah. Oh dear. Um, I was just saying I was studying uh, post qualitative research and post humanism in STEM education. So that's what brings me to Barad's work. Perfect. Thank you. Um, I just mentioned to those who were able to be here at four that we. The, the, the advert says four to five, and we're probably going to stick with that time today because of different commitments. So maybe maybe at least five past five. I know George has to leave, but then I can stay a little bit longer. Um, what we've done previously is you have the 
you either have the book or you have the online copy in front of you. And so I'm hoping that people are able to, um, you, you know, you've got them on your WhatsApp. If you're able to volunteer to read, what we will do is we will go through, we'll try and um, kind of give each pair, well, we've got a pair of authors. We've got Veronica Mitchell and Sadiq Matala and their article, sorry, their chapter, I'll just read you the name. Um, it's called, their chapter is Red Brown, that's the color, and it's Gestures for Engineering and Medical Education, Drawing on our Barad Encounter by Sadiq Motala and Veronica Mitchell. And the second chapter that we'll be diffracting through is called Chapter Iridescent, Thread, Threading, Reading Through Mull, Cutting a Fashion Theory Course Together Apart, and that's by Nikki Rabano. So um, let's just take a minute to think about that. George, I'm just wondering, are you able to, I'm really on, as you can tell, I'm at work on a different computer. If necessary, are you able to share the um, articles? It's a bit difficult to toggle between the two. Or is everybody comfortable with the copy that they have? Because I presume you've all on the WhatsApp group with George. Is that fine? Are you muted, George? <laughs> I'm happy to share it. Let me just... Okay, so maybe we can start with the, the chapter red brown. Red brown. Okay. Just open it up. Sorry, my computer's long. That's fine. That's fine. And then I suppose let's all just take a deep breath. It's a Monday. It's the beginning of the week, which is a good thing. But there's also challenges that present. And, and as we move into the space of thinking together, um, let's sort of work out what we'd like to do. So I think to start off with, um, maybe if somebody would like to make a comment initially about the chapter Red Brown, we can either start like that or we can start by reading um, through the chapter. And in previous weeks, for some reason, it happens to have worked reading from the beginning. I know that's not ideal because we don't have enough time, but sometimes it does help us to situate ourselves in the chapter. Okay. Thanks, George. Sure, let's get rid of this. Great. Okay, so maybe um, would anybody like to start and volunteer to read? Because that may be a good place to kick us off from. I'm quite comfortable, less so, but I'm comfortable with quiet and I'm also comfortable asking people to read. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I don't know if anybody would like to um, jump in. That's sort of the, the way we work together is reading, sharing the reading and then um, talking about something that puzzled us or inter interested us or made us more curious. So is anybody happy to volunteer to read the first um, the introduction of chapter Red Brown. I'll do it. <clears throat> Thank you, Hilary. Okay, introduction. <clears throat> After studying their texts for several years, <clears throat> we met Karen Barad in person in June 2017. Barad read to us their latest harrowing article, Traveling Times and Ecologies of Nothingness, Returning, Remembering, and Facing the Incalculable exploring hidden entanglements, referred to as colonialist practices of erasure and avoidance. Barad reminded us that traveling time can provide important insights and that asking questions about justice is an ethical matter, particularly in the sciences. This physical encounter sparked further theoretical inspiration and motivation for us as we early researchers embarked on our PhD journeys. Our shared interest in higher education has connected us within and between our disciplines, geomat geomatics and obstetrics. We have explored the entanglements that enact space-time matterings in our teaching and research, guided by issues of justice. In 2022, we returned to our doctoral research projects and related teaching and learning experiences to remember the entanglements that stay with us and the newness that has emerged. 
<clears throat> our collaborative friendship that developed over several years in shared reading groups has moved through intermittent dialogical interactions in different collective assemblages and enriching dynamic and expansive process. In this chapter, we trace our engagement with Barad during the residential seminar, feeling drawn into the silences and violences connected to our disciplinary and institutional contexts. We attempt to respond with care in describing our engagement with students, explaining two pedagogical encounters that glowed for us, that's McClure, Mary McClure, and continued to enrich and propel our research teaching endeavors. <clears throat> Barat questions the temporality of linear time, <clears throat> suggesting that the process of diffraction enables us to trouble time in the here, now, there, then, as each moment is an infinite multiplicity, never closed, never finished. Troubling time through diffraction requires a non-linear sensibility. See, for example, Barad 2010, 2014, 2017. We draw on troubling times as an exemplar in writing this chapter. Until recently, Sadiq was a geomatics lecturer, teaching students studying towards qualifications in surveying or geographic information systems at Cape Peninsula University of Technology in the Western Cape. He introduced storytelling into his GIS classes, which involved sharing historical narratives and inviting students to create their own digital stories, Matala and Musungu. One of his students was Zanakolo, whose digital story became a powerful part of Sadiq's pedagogical repertoire. Veronica's work is in medical education. Over the past 15 years, she has facilitated health and human rights workshops with undergraduate students in the departments of obstetrics and gynecology at the University of Cape Town. She introduced experimental and performative participatory workshops to encourage students' creativity in highlighting serious issues such as obstetric violence. Student Bongani's contribution to storytelling and his drawings became a troubling and powerful effective force in Veronica's teaching and, and research. So there are, there are footnotes at the bottom which people can look at. It's interesting, yeah, last week we were, it was interesting reading the, um, let me read the two footnotes because they are important. Um, Zanukolo Kama is a GIS practitioner and poet who has given us permission to draw on his story and be named. Obstetric violence, a term coined in South America, provides valence for engaging with this challenging global issue. And pseudonym three, sorry, footnote three is the pseudonym was used. Um, so why, George, I'm gonna ask if you could just, while we're thinking about this introduction, if you could just take us through the whole chapter because it helped last week, just remembering we're not going to get through all of it, but the images are as important as the words. So maybe if you could just scroll through and we can look at them as we orientate ourselves into this piece. Thank you. That's been put in on Ribic's hedge that's overlaid on the dot density map. Yeah, that's important to be thinking about. Thanks, George. You can go to the next. Um, keep going. Maybe we can just pause on another one. Thank you. That's the other one. I'll get a couple more images, but. Thanks. Okay, thanks. We can go to the end because they're just these two images, but it's fine to just see the end of the, the chapter. Thank you.
So are there any comments about um, the first, I mean, I know Sadiq is here, but it's a very, um, the, the writing, but it's, I don't think it's very easy to write with someone else, but the writing in this chapter is, you can see there was a careful, and actually I think that was also in the description writing between Veronica and Sadiq, you can see that. So it's quite obvious in the, the way the chapter comes across. But um, any comments about the first two pages that we've read in this introduction? From anyone in the room? Anything you'd like to particularly ask about or are particularly interested in? Uh, George, you're still muted. Sorry. Um, just that, just to note that Siddiq um, gave his apologies on the group. As oh yeah, that's a pity that we, yeah, he's not able to see. Um, I mean, he's he's had to leave. Yeah. Um, are people happy to? If you would like to, we can carry on reading. Or do people <coughs> can make a I mean, have you all read about this? Van Ribbick's Hedge, do you, I mean, have you, I'm not presuming people have read the chapter because that's quite difficult, but this is very, um, I've heard Sadiq um, present before, but this is very important, this work um, around the hedge. So maybe I would suggest that we carry on from with entanglements and just see how, if we can get to that part of the, that section. Okay, would somebody else like to read? Yeah. Oh gosh, <laughs> we're having a very quiet group today. Okay, I'm happy to. Hello. I have no problem reading, but I don't know if you can hear me. We can hear you, Anne. Thanks for reading. You can hear me? Okay. Hear yeah. I'm happy to read because it helps me understand. Perfect. Uh, so in, entanglements. Yeah. A delicate Great. tissue of ethicality runs through the marrow of being. There is no getting away from ethics. Mattering is an integral part of the ontology of the world in its dynamic presencing. Not even a moment exists on its own. This and that, here and now, don't pre-exist what happens, but come alive with each meeting. The world and its possibilities for, for becoming are remade with each moment. Personally, I find that quotation very exciting because it means that uh, for me, the message is basically you're living in the moment and don't, and don't miss out because uh, there's something happening now and in every now that uh, wasn't there before and won't be there afterwards. So you have to be with it now. Have I misunderstood? Although I suppose I would say that now is living in the now that has existed and is to come. So it's not that it's living in this now, but that there's a this and a that and a yeah. So um, I, I agree with what you said, but I would extend that because of the idea of temporal diffraction that times are bleeding through each other. So even though it's an awareness of this time, it's still with the awareness of a past in the present and a, pre a future in the present and, and not that they're in a line because um, they're integrated, right? Are they integrated or, inter or, or entwined? <laughs> In <time. laughs> Th those, words get, those words muddle us up because they, well, anybody can jump in, because they, they always infer sort of a, a forward and a backward. But yeah, integrated, mm -hmm. in, interrelated, intra-related, I suppose, is what we sort of hoping okay. for. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but I mean, it's, it's, as you say, the world, as she says, the world and its possibilities for becoming are remade with each moment, which does help us to think that the past isn't behind us and gone as if it's not able to be remade in this moment, or as if the future is to come and cannot be remade in this moment. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. Mm. Should I mm. go on? Yes, you, you can, unless anybody wants to. And I don't know, George, if you can keep an eye on if people are raising hands. I can see some more, but not everyone. Thank you. Thanks, Anne. 
at Monkey Valley Conference Center amidst pelting rain and cold winter days, we met and moved with Bharat through conversations, meals, creative activities and presentations. We recognized that our work was becoming transdisciplinary activism, disrupting the usual boundaries in our scientific fields to move into the in-between spaces where art intersects with science, provoking questions around ethics and social justice. The two-day retreat <coughs> provided lasting inspiration towards a different kind of becoming. We were grateful to have been invited to present our in-progress doctoral research projects, which were accompanied by a few slides and short videos. George, if you want to scroll, thank you. Okay. Thanks, Anne. If you Should want to I carry go on? on, please go on, yeah, and then we'll look at the map when you finish. Thanks. Siddiq's PhD research sought out the useful, useful insights that could emerge for geomet geomatics education from the process of combining storytelling with critical pedagogy, mediated through a critical post-humanist stance towards engineering education. To illustrate how he combined storytelling and GIS in his teaching, he told the story of Khoi Dutch contact in early colonial South Africa. An important part of the story was the decision by Jan van Riebeck, the Dutch commander at the Cape, to erect a boundary hedge to keep out the indigenous Khoi people from the land claimed by the Dutch. By superimposing the location of the boundary hedge on a map of current day Cape Town, Siddiq illustrated the divide between black and white people, correlating roughly to the location of the original head, hedge. What was striking and impactful for Siddiq was Barad's response. They said that in a diffractive analysis, it is important to identify gestures to the future in the past. What was the future that the Dutch or the Khoi gestured to? Barad said that in the making of that hedge, was a particular future. This made Siddiq realize that we can identify and analyze gestures all around us. Thinking more about gesturing allowed his confidence to grow in the experimental classroom practice of linking stories to maps and enabling affirmative gestures to the future. Futures. Yeah, thank you. Um, wow. I know. I think <laughs> my I would second the wow because I think I've seen this map. I've seen this presented in color, um, superimposed on where we live in Cape Town in South Africa. Um, sorry, I'm already talking. So maybe are there people who'd like to comment about um, what Sadiq has written, what Barad's response was about gestures, just to yeah. Hi. Hi, Tandiwe. Are you ready to share with us? <laughs> I, 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 I don't know in the moment of the now and the future if I'm ready. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, everyone. Sorry I'm late. We've had power cuts after a six hour load shedding thing, and then there were power trips. <laughs> so sorry about that. We're with you. We're with you. Um, um, I'm just giving a diffraction, just not, uh, I'm imagining a performance that I, 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 I co-created with young children at yeah. some point in 2018. And it was about really thinking about what ontology and epistemology would, might mean for an African child. Mm -hmm. And this was completely coming from disrupting the, the narratives given by the radio. So radio, having come from the Radio Emilia practice to say, how could we have con reconfigurations of African education aligned for the African child? So that was the conversation at the time. Quite too many, but okay. Anyway, when these performances were done, we carefully selected music to align to drumming and uh, just creating that feeling of being you know, in a jungle, African, you can imagine even the, the costume spoke to that in their own performativity. 
And when the performance day came, actual performance on stage in, in the language of art, when the children were performing, one of the children had an, 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 a spiritual breakthrough. So this is a six year old who had a spiritual breakthrough. And one of the spiritual leaders said, this child has been connected to the ancestors. And it's very troubling that as we're reading about time, is that in that moment, past, present and future were, were one or maybe entangled. Because in that statement, there was a sense of how the ancestors continued, continued to speak through the now. Though our, our humanist conception of ancestor is someone that was, that is my first point. Mm. The second point is really aligned to what one of the Africanists had to say about that experience. I said, how can a six year old child have sort of that, that connection? And of course, speaking to the overall performances of the children. And this particular Afri Pan Africanist scholar said, you can colonize the body, the physical body, but what the colonizers forgot to colonize was the spirit. And I think that, that actually is speaking to me in the now, but in the past and in the future to say, the notions of colonization spoke to the physicality. Mm. But what Bharat is slowly teaching me through the diffraction of text is that even the notion of human is just aligned to the physical body or the mind. But bodies are much more than just the physical entities or the mind, the intellect. Bodies are entanglements of the in-betweens and other things. So that is just my contribution and I hope that makes sense. Mm. Thank you, Tandiwe. I, um, yeah, I appreciated your sharing that. I mean, that's, sorry I'm again sorry I'm just starting to speak but please if anybody else would like to make a comment and then I will make a comment to Tandiwe would anybody like to comment on what Tandiwe said so maybe I'll set us off and I mean I was quite struck by your your, your the way you conceptualize the idea that ancestors speak through the now but often that is the idea that it was this, oh yes, you know, the ancestors, uh, you, they are, they were here, they laid the ground, they were here before you. And so it's interesting, certainly thinking about um, how do we explain the, you know, the calling, hearing that, knowing, um, because it, it speaks to, to temporal diffraction that it wasn't something that has happened and is gone already. Um, and then it's interesting, your, your idea that we, are actually all of those things and it's not only the spirit but it's as you said all the entanglements after i i i appreciated that from you today thank you yeah Roseanne, yeah. Roseanne does, do, do you have access to um a color version of this map because in the book it's really hard to, know. to read the distribution of race i mean it's useless yeah you know that on the the idea is that i also had this issue about the color on the i mean i could look this up but I'm i looked at images i couldn't find it google you know, image. well if you look at Sadiq's phd you'll find it there i think that's where i'm thinking about it but um it it makes a difference and can you see where the head is i mean basically this is cape town I think I'm not drawing the circle actually on this, the, my addo. So this is Cape Town and essentially this hedge is basically, if, at Kirstenbosch you can still see the remnants of the hedge that was made. So I know you're talking about the actual race and um, racial groups, but um, maybe I can just see if I can find his PhD and then I can see if I can share that. I'm, I, I'm not sure if it is in there, but it, it could be. Um, maybe he could. You could ask him to post just a, that yes. image on the chat. On the chat, yeah. He, well, he's just left. He's had to leave the group now because of his that. load shedding. But um, let's just see. Oh, okay. I'll ask on the WhatsApp group if he can share it with us. Thanks. Okay, perfect. Thanks, George. Okay. Sure. So, yeah. Oh, there we go. Let me see if it's in here. Um, 
to me very quick scroll through his whole PhD. But what may be in an article I've seen. Um, here it is. Okay. George, if you'd let me just, oh, sorry, I can share. Can you just stop sharing so I can share? Yes, I can. So, oh, yeah. Um, shares. There we go. Yeah. Continue. So I'm going to share. Okay. <laughs> it's very different. I mean, it's a bit small, sorry, but I will try and, ooh, gosh. Okay, now it's like, as you know, when you're on Zoom, it's like you're flying a very small plane. Okay, there we go. I mean, I imagine flying a small plane is as difficult as a big one. <laughs> um, this is, can you see what, and now, let me just try and make this, um, let me enlarge that, sorry. Hilary, can you see that? I know it's not probably not as helpful. No, I'm, just, I'm actually just gonna take a picture Wait, of let, it. Yeah, let me just try and, um, sorry. Can I just stop sharing and I'm just gonna have one page of his PhD. Otherwise that's will probably help us a little bit. Now I've just lost it completely. Okay, here we go. Does anybody know what page is? 87. And I what that how I can. Yeah. Okay, I'll do it like that. I'm going to share again. And now, I know what time. Okay, does that help a little bit more? So, black African is the green dots. Yellow is colored, um, the, I don't know, pinky red is Indian, browny one is Indian, and then white and other. So, um, this is a dot density map for population, showing the population by race groups. One purple dot equals 100 white people, one yellow dot equals 100 colored people, one green dot, 100 black people, and one red dot, 100 Indian people. The Lisbic River is shown as the light blue line, and the boundary hedge is shown as a red line. One can see the location of the original hedge is close to the apartheid boundary between, apart between white and colored areas, which is largely still in place in post-apartheid Cape Town. And then if we move to the... Um, other map on the right hand side, you can see the, the, the hedge. And again, this is, you know, Table Mountain, this is the Kirstenbosch area. Anyway, I'm, I'm aware of time suddenly because now we haven't even started Veronica section. Oh, so I'm gonna. Um, can I you can just show us that picture again so I can take a picture of it? Oh, yes, I can. Sorry. There we go. There Thank we go. You. Yeah, I can actually see the difference between the red and the purple here, but also you can orientate yourself if you know Cape Town and South Africa, you'll see it. Have you got a um, picture? Not yeah. yet. Oh. <laughs> um, Roseanne, could I ask that maybe someone else shares the next reading just because I'm going to have to leave and then it's going to mess up. The, okay. Uh, um, yeah, I think um, maybe can you can you share till you leave and then I'm going to ask people just to use their books just because I can't quite take mine out yet. Unless somebody is happy to volunteer. Not a problem, I can do it. Yeah. Um, Veronica, I mean, um, you saw it, Hilary? Yeah, thanks. Okay, perfect. I'm just going to ask if we could maybe do just five minutes. We'll just read um, Veronica's section when she starts on page 134 just to get a sense of, of her ideas, which is very powerful about obstetric violence. And then we will move to Nikki's chapter. So, okay, so we're gonna do red brown still, 134. Yeah. Thank you. Um, While we're reading, I'll just sort myself okay. upload it. Okay. Red brown. So Hilary, thank you for reading, even though it sounds like your throat's a bit sore. Does anybody else want to read any volunteer for this section about when we're gonna start with Bongani um, at the bottom. Here we go. Yeah. And Tandiwe, you see there's a little section on ancestors worship just above this section, but we can maybe get to that again. Okay, so, oh, it's a can bit still see? Yeah, George, it's a bit big. It's a bit big. Oh, no, it's perfect. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Um, anyone want to read from Bongani? Tandiwe, are you able to read? Sorry for picking on you, but I um. Is this you... the other, uh, Rosen? This, yeah, this is the is other. This the part. other document. 
No, it's the same document. It's on page 134. It's the other part. It's Veronica's part of the chapter. Well, I mean, they do sort of diffract through each other, but this is Veronica's section about Pungani, who was a CASA student. Ah, oh, what's happening to my computer? Okay. Page 100. 134. 134. Okay, I'll read that. Thank you. Sorry, guys. You. From Bongani. Bongani. Bongani was a Tosa student who traveled to the Western Cape to pursue his undergraduate medical studies. He aimed to become a doctor to serve his community in the Eastern Cape where he currently practices his profession. A return to the past in the present towards a future to address the needs of an impoverished community. In Veronica's research interview with Bongani and following classroom communications, she was struck by the openness and generosity in sharing the, spe the spectrum of his experiences in obstetrics. He explained, the one thing that people don't realize is that what you encounter there as a student, it can be traumatic. Mm. If you don't talk about it or do something about it, it doesn't sit well with you and it can be something that eats you up. Mm. Veronica's participatory workshops, which of course include various forms of art making, have opened up a space for difficult dialogues among students in their fourth year of study. During these times together, drawings, performances, texts, students interaction, um, interact as Ver 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 uh, sorry guys, Veronica encourages students to think about ethical dilemmas and the materiality related to these dilemmas emerging through their immersion in curricular tasks. This is particularly in connection with the injustices that pervade in the health system. Bongani's contributions included a role play in class by him and his fellow students, a drawing and then later a written text returning to a meaningful moment in the birthing unit, sharing his experiences in person with several later student cohorts as an invited guest was the most relevant for this chapter. He would tell a re, what's that word? Riveting. He would yeah. tell a riveting story about his initiation into clinical obstetrics. He openly explained his positioning as a student, feeling powerless and helpless as he witnessed. Uh, iatrogenic. I also don't know that iatrogenic harm. It seems. He later oh, wow. took part in Veronica's doctoral research project. His story continues to stay with her as a hotspot. She asks, how does medical education propagate violences in the practice of obstetrics? Mm. I'd like to pause there. Mm. And, and let me just give you the footnote for number nine. It says, iatrogenic refers to harm caused by medical intervention. It's yeah, it's quite something. So thanks, um, Tandiwa, you wanted to say something? It, it, it's just interesting how, it's interesting how Bongani's decision to, be, to become a doctor was already entangled in the now when he was young for the future. <laughs> It's making me think about um, a section of my PhD as well. Um, so when I first came to UCT to, to, to pursue my doctoral studies, I didn't know then that my daughter was born before she was born. And having been in the School of Physics to pursue studies in physics, I was already entangled with Barad without mm. having had a physical connection through the eye in space time with her, with them, excuse me. Mm. When Olochu was born, and I will say eventually, there was a move towards going to early childhood where I reconnected, re got re-entangled, a return to physics through early childhood. 
when I became a teacher, when I decided to become a teacher, I wanted to work with, a, with early childhood. But one of my friends said to me, you can't be teaching children, you're too intelligent for that. So I was like, you, I must do maths and science. So in the past, that is becoming a present now, in the past, I was already in the future with young children. Through interactions with my, with my daughter, my maternal daughter, through the interactions with the children that I am now supposedly working with. And I'm still in the Department of Physics through my interactions with Barad. And so I'm really, I'm seeing a lot of, I, I can connect. There's a lot of resonance to Bongani's story, to my story, now I'm sharing mm. and storing my PhD journey mm. or my ongoing PhD journey in its unfolding. And Thanks. I was struggling with the concept of time this morning. I can't believe uh, it's, it's making sense. <laughs> Good. No, that's important. I, I mean, I agree with you. I think it's, this is the work that Barad helps us to work through and think about. Um, again, I mean, the irony is that I am aware of time, but just any comments from anybody about what, um, what Tandiwe read for us about obstetric violence and I'll repeat the question she ended with because it's really important uh, this was Veronica's research project she asks um, how does medical education so think about it not I mean it's ironic propagate violence in the practice of obstetrics um, and again Veronica somebody I know and I've worked been able to see and I know lots of you have been able to see her work and this whole idea of violence and obstetrics being very you know, yeah, anyway, I, I won't say too much more, but anyone in the group want to comment on that? And then I do think we can try and maybe read the last two paragraphs. And, and certainly thinking about how it affects, how it connects with Barad, when you think about Barad's work is always about justice and this idea of violence and justice in obstetric violence is, is quite important. So um, I'm gonna ask, Tandiwe, if you could read from more than 20 years ago, just these last two paragraphs, we'll make a comment and then go on to Nikki's work. Do you want to start with more than 20? Sure. More than 20 years ago, Jukes, Abrahams and Vo noted the lack of acknowledgement of the mistreatment of birthing women in South Africa and internationally. Only in the past decade has a growing body of research and related initiatives begun to address obstetric violence seriously. Much of the focus has been through exposure to patient stories. Recent global studies provide statistical evidence of the widespread prevalence of the violence. Colonialism has strongly influenced obstetric practices with entanglements to slavery and biopolitics. There has been a systemic normalization of abuse in midwifery. Jakes, Abraham, and Vo point out that violence evident in obstetrics resonates with the pervasive societal violence, such as taxi violence, criminal violence, high rates of rape and murder, and personal domestic violence. The recent movement addressing obstetric violence calls for decolonization of maternity, noting that the obstetric institution can be seen as fundamentally modern and as a locus of modern violence and colonial power. Thanks, Tandiwe. So I'm going to ask just to, just ask you to keep that in mind. And um, George is going to stop sharing, and I'll start sharing the next chapter, just so that we have make sure we have a bit of time to do that. Um, sorry. So, any comments from anyone? I'm just going to find iridescent. Um, but yeah, I would strongly recommend that we read, that you do read, we all read, reread Veronica's chapter. The idea of the um, violence is the next part of it is called erasure, which is really interesting. She talks about time space hopping and she talks about, um, yeah, and, and sorry, we're not going to be able to get through as we certainly haven't been able to get through the rest of Siddiqs. But this just gives us a, a kind of a, a sense of what it is they're writing. And hopefully you'll come to the book launch on Saturday and hear more about and what's happening, the details are on the DCD group. It's this Saturday at 10 to 12 at UCT um, on lower campus in the School of Education. Um, thanks, Hilary, and thanks, Tandiwe, for reading. This is
Can you all see, I'm presuming you can see this chapter iridescent threading through Mal, um, cutting a fashion theory course together apart. And as you know, Nikki, or Nikki Romano is one of Viv, she, Viv and I think Iris van der Tain was a, a, or Catherine Thiel, sorry, I may be getting that incorrect, were PhD supervisors. It is in the chapter, which I read. <laughs> Um, and also I know I should know and um, Nikki was also just said started a PhD when this in 2017 so I don't know if we have somebody in the group who would be prepared uh, to read please um, maybe let's just do a bit of justice if we can to this chapter okay we got more okay millions of Tony, are you comfortable to read or just because I can, I can try? Um, I can certainly try. I'm reading off my screen. Green. Okay. Um, I was fortunate to attend the weekend seminar with Karen Barat at Monkey Valley Cape Town in 2017. This coincided with my registering for a PhD study that explores ways of reconfiguring an art history curriculum through co effective encounters with artworks. Having come to academia through my visual arts training, I felt somewhat out of my depth at the workshops because philosophy and science were not part of my arts education. However, given that I've always been drawn to the wonderment of the world, I was excited to learn more. During the workshop, Barad encouraged us to attend to the questions that matter to our research practices, to honor our inheritances and understand that we are of the world rather than in the world. They also explained that quantum field theory inhabits super, superposition, superpositions, that there is no time outside of phenomena and that space and time or space-time mattering cannot be assumed as already given before research starts. As I yearned and struggled to make the leap to quantum thinking, I remember how my Cartesian molded brain strained to grasp and process these mind-blowing and seemingly impossible abstract concepts. The challenge of making sense of quantum field theory is evident in my journal notes. A haphazard flurry of words and doodles, scratchings and scrawls that sought to capture the essence of Barad's teaching. However, I was yet to understand that rather than describe, represent and capture concepts, sorry, capture, concepts are specific material doings or enactments of the world. In this chapter, I trace a series of interwoven strands that thread through space and time, as I think make with Barad's teachings that begin at the workshop and have continued in various ways that include reading groups with colleagues, as well as slow reading on my own. I'll do I'll the focus. Um, okay. I'll do the All right. I'm for me, the practice of slow reading involves reading texts aloud, that's us doing that now, recording them on my phone and listening to the recordings and making with them. While listening, I engage in making activities such as stitching, doodling and scrolling. For more on the C Romano 2022, and I presume that's a PhD. Thanks, um, Tony. I focus on Barad's proposition of thought experiments as material discursive matterings, whereby thinking manifests as both disembodied and more than human activity. In particular, I explore how making processes such as sewing, stitching and threading might be conceived as conceptual practices that activate pedagogical encounters through which I consider Donna Haraway's notion of becoming with knowledge as material mattering. I also examine whether these concepts can be put to work in pedagogical practices as I configure a fashion history and theory course for second and third year fashion students at a University of Technology in Cape Town. Um, I, I see I missed, I didn't let okay. you interlude. <laughs> it's okay, I'll read them and they are important. The footnotes, thanks, Tony. Um, footnote two, which is about more than human activity. Note that the hyphen, sorry, it was material discursive mattering, sorry. Note the hyphen between 
material and discursive indicates that no priority is given to either materiality or discursivity. Neither one stands outside the other within an agentalist, a gentle realist ontology, that's Barad. Um, and then number three was about um, becoming with, and that's about Donna Hathaway argues that becoming with, not becoming is the name of the game. Thinking with Vinciana Despray, she are, elaborates that becoming with is how partners render each other capable. And then footnote four, which was material mattering. Vicky writes, my understanding of mattering is informed by Barad's double entendre reading of matter and meaning as mattering that embodies the inseparability of matter and meaning. And see Barad and Gandolfo, which is a great article, 2021. Thanks, Tony. I think we can keep going till the end of this paragraph and then get some comments. Um, the chapter tracks the process of my thinking with needles, cotton, and a piece of loosely woven mus muslin mull held securely in place in a bamboo embroidery ring. The practice is open-ended as I pay attention to the materiality of these uh, materials and their teachings. While there's no particular outcome in mind, the entangled threads materialize ideas, concepts, questions, and learnings in ways that are not too removed and abstracted for me to grasp. In other words, I examine how the material conditions of threading can be reconfigured in such a way that they are understood as integral to theorizing. A critical tool that has manifested through this iterative practice of returning with stitching is the reading, a practice that enacts a gentle cuts into the textiles of fabric, sorry, of fashion history and practice and its co concomitant feminist and colonial histories. Threading makes sense to me because it embodies the diffractive process of stitching with and through Barad's readings and teachings in ways that get underneath thought. And, oh, sorry, I've, I've lost, oh, hang on. Sorry, I lost the screen for a moment. Um, underneath thought and thought, oh. And, to, and opens up towards the thinking differently about thought. The key to Barad's agential realist framework built on Boer's quantum understanding is the process of diffraction. This underscores the indeterminacy of matter and reconfigure, reconfigures notions of causality, agency, space, time, and matter. This is crucial to my practice because it foregrounds how temporality and spatiality are iteratively reconfigured through intra-active material discursive encounters that reveal how matter and meaning are mutually articulated. In other words, unlike Newtonian approaches to linear and chronological history that tend to fix the past, the past, present and future are always already entangled and the past cannot be left behind. Thanks, um, Tony. And I'm gonna give you all a minute to think about um, what Nikki is suggesting to us, opening up for us and her theorizing of threading. And I'm gonna do that by taking us through her chapter because she also uses images um, and they're also very powerful in her work. So, sorry, let me try and work out how to, yeah, sorry, scroll through. Um, this figure says detail of threading showing how the rectilinear mull grid is pulled out of alignment. And then figure 1.4 is a screenshot from the infinity nothingness and the undoing of self seminar hosted by Cornell University in July of 2021. And that I was also at that Zoom where this is actually, this is Karen Barad sitting in front of her, the image she had a, um, this image behind her on the Zoom. Um, figure 1.5, I don't know if you can, if you know who Viv Wazilak is, she is seen peering through Studio Drift's queen chair at the Stedelijk, whoever speaks Dutch, please jump in, museum in Amsterdam in 2017. So that's Viv's face coming, well, Viv standing behind this and you can see her image quite clearly. This section is called Ghostly Threads and then fashioning through threads through history. 
And then this is a detail showing transversal threads cutting across the rectilinear wave weave of the mull. And you can imagine all of these would be very um, interesting in color, which they are and will be on the website. And then Elizabeth Vichny Lebron's portrait of Marie Antoinette entitled Lorena Gaul, the Queen dressed in a Gaul, with a child of Gaul, exhibited at Salon de Louvre in 1783. And that's from Wikipedia and is available in the public domain. So those are um, the, I think I'm going to just going the wrong way. Yeah, that's, those are the images from Nikki's chapter. Sorry, that's the last one. Um, the detail of threading showing iridescent thread, but we can't see that as carefully because it's in black and white. Um, okay, so any comments? Um, obviously, it's very helpful to just keep reading, but if anybody would like to make a comment about something they've heard, um, Tony reading or something that made them think differently. Uh, please excuse me, but I'm not very much on top of the, the theory, but my observation of what I think, and I haven't read this chapter, but it ties in with what uh, Tandiwe was saying earlier, earlier on, is that uh, I was just thinking when you do threading, when you do embroidery or any, or any needlework, the backside or the underside of the work, um, you can't really see the, the detail in the picture. You, you, it, it's distorted. And what, what you were saying earlier on about, like she's only now realizing, looking back, how the past is part of her present. It's, it's like um, that when you really, when you're in, in a certain time, period you mm. can't see how the threads all mm. fit together is what I'm taking from what we're reading here and that it's only by a sort of um by it all coming together and, and different ways of looking at it and looking at it from different angles and in different um positions that you start to see the full picture of of the process that is taken um, shape as this piece of work has been created. Mm. Um, I have some thoughts about that, but anybody before I jump in, anybody else? Thank you, Tony. Any other comments from anyone about um, what Tony's just shared with us? Um, maybe, I mean, I will start then. So Tony, I'm also very interested in tapestry and I, I also crocheted during my PhD and also got to the point of being fascinated by the other side and is it actually an other side because you know with, with when you crochet it's the same piece of thread is going right through the back and the front so it's interesting what you're saying about um, I mean the only thing I may disagree with is will we ever know the full picture but it is ironic that when we look at and I'm just trying to think I don't have a tapestry right actually I have one little one here this is a little this is a tapestry I did years ago with a little heart, but the idea is that you don't actually look at the other side. We're always looking at what is the one that we're choosing to show with the world as if it could even be held together without everything else that's happening at the back. So that's really interesting, your idea that it's um, also this idea. I like the way you say distorted. That's interesting because there's, there's an idea of sometimes perfection, like, for example, have this perfect heart, but then the distortion being whatever else is also there and they actually exist at the same time. I, I also, um, thank you, thank you for sharing that. Um, I don't know if we've got about three minutes left, so maybe we could, if somebody else, Sandiwe, did you want to comment or? Yes, yes, I'm not sure if I, I heard the discussion nicely because there's a little bit of noise here, but um, just reading through, uh, diffracting through the, the two, um, texts and the diffraction that the, the participants are also entangled with. I am concerned, ne? I as in really like just detaching myself now for a moment. Um, the way in which we think about reality is <laughs> much influenced by the representationalist perspective, mm. which 
has its ground to the Cartesian and Newtonian thinking. Mm -hmm. So perhaps maybe our thinking with time is also as a result of those entangled experiences with how concepts have been, um, how the experiences have been brought to us. Um, so it's not that people were not aware of time in terms of past, present, and future. They are not able to see the connections in terms of the intra-activity because of the reflexivity practice. So we are taught, in my perspective, to reflect on the past. Mm -hmm. That was, but not to become in the moment with the past, present, and future. Mm -hmm. And if you think about schooling in particular, because maybe some of us are educational specialists, mm -hmm. you would imagine that we prepare from the developmentalist perspective, children for the future, what you do, it doesn't matter where you come from. So there's that erasure of the past. Mm -hmm. It is what you do in the present, the hard work you put in towards your future, which is the same developmentalist perspective, which is used towards the, the unfolding of the PhD journey to say, if Otter, you want to be assumed within the academic space as an academic, you need to ensure that you put in the effort in the now for the future. So even in our very tellings and our experiences and everyday languaging, we are still fixed on that Cartesian dualistic framework that we, we ourselves even as researchers within post-humanist are continuously unsettled by these concepts. I don't know if that makes sense. Yeah. You got some nodding, Hilary's nodding. <laughs> yes. Um, Thanks, Tandiwe. Uh, I am aware of time and I'm going to make a suggestion that we read Nikki's last paragraph, essentially a last section called Loose Threads and just maybe end with that as a way to think through this. So, um, and I don't know if anybody would like to read, I'm happy to take okay. us through that. Oh yeah. Sorry, I don't need that for someone. Okay, but uh, let me, I'll do it. Um, loose Threads. And it's on the screen and it's on page 169 if you're reading at home. In threading together this chapter, I've tried to trouble traditional ways of reading and writing. And I resist the pressure to write a conclusion that ties up loose ends. Inspired by the interference effects of iridescence that activate shimmering colors, the threads interfere with normative academic writing practices that focus on findings within a fixed frame. And uh, footnote 17 says, when Karen and Viv invited us to contribute to this book, they posed the following funny question. If you could give your chapter a color, what would it be? Over time, I've unsettled on iridescence as a color for this chapter. I'm drawn to the diffractive effects of iridescence because it shimmers in an indeterminate space, interfering with the fixity of color, revealing the liveliness of the visible spectrum. For more on iridescence, see Barad, 2007, page 18. The open-ended threaded trajectories resist being stitched together. The edges are raw, they reject attempts at invisible mending. Instead, they expose holes in the fabric that are left gaping. The unresolved strands and tears help me to think among, sorry, help me to think through among other things, the inheritance of the fashion industry as one that poisoned the planet is born through the bodies of African slaves who survived the Atlantic crossing to work in them cotton fields back home. Um, footnote 18, phrase taken from the song, Cotton Fields, the Cotton Song, also known as In Them Old Cotton Fields Back Home, that was written by American blues musician Huddy Ledbetter, also known as Led Belly. While many musicians have covered it, the song was first recorded in 1940. And as an industry that continues to exploit child labor the world over, Threading enacts a diffractive stitching together a part that has given me a language to express my thinking about thinking differently. The bamboo frame becomes a portal through which I iteratively return to the disturbing question that surfaced and interfered with the surface during Barard's 2017 seminar. By threading through the mull, the questions that matter to research practice start to make sense. Threading also materializes as a practice through which I begin to honor our inheritances and understand that we are of the world rather than in the world. 
Furthermore, in uncovering iterative matters of concern, a gentle cuttings together apart confirm for me that there is no totality, no determination or cut that is once and for all. Barad and Gandalf for 2021, page 13. So hopefully you've all got your copies on the book and are interested in reading the rest of the chapters that we haven't covered over these four weeks. The um, book launch is happening on Friday, Saturday, sorry, as I said, from 10 to 12. But maybe one last comment, if anybody has a comment about Mickey's reading and thinking about Siddiq and Veronica's chapter. It, it is an impossible task, I said this last week as well, to do what we're trying to do, but at least we've made an attempt. <laughs> is her frame like a cut? I mean, it's setting up boundaries. Uh, are you asking that? No. I mean, isn't she saying it's not a cut, but a because there is no cut, no totality, no determination, or, or cut that is once and for all. I mean, it can be, but it's it's not. Um, she's suggesting a portal through which she returns all the time, but. It, yeah, I mean, it's it's not that it's not a cut, I suppose, yeah. Because it is creating the boundary, but. I don't know, that's worth thinking more about. Yeah, I think we, let's leave with a troubling question. <laughs> I shouldn't have answered so quickly. From Hilary, that. Um, can I just ask, I've, uh, the concept of a cut in this context, does it have a, a, a depth or a direction, or is that too physical a definition? Um, Hilary, do you want to jump in there? Or? Um, no, I was still thinking about the frame, and I didn't actually hear what Anne asked. I was, I don't know much about cutting in these contexts. And I just asked whether the cut has a depth or a, a direction, or whether that's just too physical a question. The cut is more esoteric than that. And more, yeah, I mean, I would suggest more of not an abstraction in the sense that it can't be thought of, but um, you know, if you if you look, you can go to many, many of us have rewritten or use the cutting together part, etc. So yeah, I would suggest that it's not necessarily depth and, you know, um, sorry, depth and direction you asked, but you're more of a, yeah. Well, my understanding of the cut is that, you know, you've got the whole phenomenon mm -hmm. and, the, and the cut kind of measures or, tries to understand the entanglements of part of that phenomenon. But while you're doing that, it's all becoming, it's continuing. So you, you cut it apart, but it's still together. And what it is, is continually changing. So you're only getting a, a kind of glimpse of an entanglement through the, the cut and the measurements used to kind of work out what things are with, within that part of the phenomenon. Uh, mind, my mind still works with uh, equivalences. And uh, the question is, is the cut more like a window? It's a, a way to look in, or the cut is something that uh, is a way of breaking apart and reassembling? I can't, I can't get my mind around the concept of the cut. So I'll I'll read. Well, the cut is, I mean, it's normally the cutting together part. So let me, maybe we can finish with page 10, which is the introduction from Karen and, and Viv, Karen Morris and Viv Bozilak. And so they've written, as Viv Bozilak writes to fractally with Candace Kuby on 2022, page 82, our emphasis, it is only through specific interactions in acting a gentle cuts that entities are co-constituted as determinately distinct, bounded, and propertied. This differs from Cartesian cuts, which Baby. is an already distinct and discrete. This is not enough volume. 
an object. Sorry, I'm going to mute. Um, sorry, let me just mute somebody. There we go. Sorry. Um, this is thus what we consider to be bounded objects are parts of entangled phenomena, which are ontologically primitive relations without pre-existing relata. The agental cut renders temporarily determinate the inherent ontological indeterminacy of phenomena by enacting a local resolution, Barad 2007. This is an agental separability, a cutting together a part in one move, not a radical separability. We let the notion of cutting together a part inspire the pedagogy of slowing down together a part above and writing together a part in, for example, the recent diffractive writing with other post-humanist colleagues for a new post-qualitative research book series. So in truth, <laughs> Barad style, let's just keep additional questions to keep us thinking. I don't know if that, that's on page 11 of the actual, sorry, page 10 of the actual book. Um, thank you. Yeah, which hopefully will help a little. I'm going to say thank you to those of you who were able to be here today. Hopefully um, we'll see each other soon and keep, yeah, keep keep an eye on the group to see what will be happening from next Monday. We'll let George share with us about that. Thanks everyone. Um, thank you. Roseanne, is the, is the launch gonna be recorded? Um, I yeah, there will be an online launch because we have some people not living here and coming in. So it should be recorded. I imagine it will be recorded, yes. And additionally, people, the chap the authors are going to be um, talking a little bit about their chapter as an additional kind of invitation to people to think with them through their work. Yeah, so that will be available. So, and, and can one join online? You can, yeah, yeah. So there is a, an online, a possibility to join online, which will be great. So yeah. will we get an, an invitation? Should, are you not, have, you, have you seen it on the group, um, on the DCD group? Let me just double check. I'll I'll remind you. There was an invitation earlier. Yeah. It's, I think it's, last week there was an invitation. Yeah, but not the date and the and the uh, and the link. Yeah, yeah. It was somewhere. So <laughs> through, yeah. I know it's difficult to keep track of everything, but I'll remind George to send us another one so we can be sure. Perfect. Thank okay, thanks very much. Everyone. Yeah, it was lovely. Fascinating. Thank you. <laughs> Good to meet some of you. Good to see some of you, and we'll chat soon. Thank you. Anyone else online? Have a good week. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.